Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Georgia Greer. I'm the Head of Insights at the ISC, and I'm delighted to be welcoming you all to what promises to be a really interesting webinar on a topic really close to my heart, which is candidate experience. So, Sova, thank you so much for hosting today's well webinar and welcoming us to this topic. Um, I'm going to hand to Nicola now, who's going to take us through some further information and into the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Georgia, and hello, everybody. Thank you for, for joining us on your, your lunch breaks, hopefully, today. Um, so yeah, I'm Nicola, Nicola Tatham. I'm a chartered occupational psychologist, and I am Director of Psychology here at SOVA Assessment. I assume some of you may have come across SOVA Assessment before. If you've not, um, we are um, an assessment experience platform. Um, the idea being that we would streamline, can help streamline how your organisation assesses talent, helping you to hire and develop kind of the best and the most diverse talent and trying to save you time and cost at the same time. So trying to support you with delivering more for less. However, today I'm here as your chair on this ISE webinar. So I wanted to start by allowing our panel to introduce themselves. So in no particular order, I'm going to start with Hannah. Hannah, do you just want to share a, a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, I'm um, Hannah Middleditch and I head up all the early career recruitment for Nationwide Building Society. Um, I've worked in recruitment for, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't actually want to say how long I've worked in recruitment because I'll give you the understanding of how old I am now, but worked in recruitment for a long time in various guises. i um, been working at Nationwide for, for seven years in the in-house team. Um, obviously, as I say, working um, most recently in the, in the early career space. Um, my history has come from an RPA background as well, so um, working with various clients, using lots of different solutions um, and project managing those. Um, and then before that worked in, in sort of agency um, and sort of um, high street recruitment. So I've had kind of a variety of, of recruitment experience um, over the last few years. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today to, to talk to you all about the journey that we've been on at, at Nationwide specifically. Um, and how we've kind of used technology and, and also sober over the last few years to really enhance our sort of candidate and hiring manager experience in the early career space. So yeah, really excited to, to meet you all and to, and to also have a chat with all the um, great panelists we've got on today. Oh, sorry, Nick. The day I was on mute. <laughs> Good start. <laughs> and th thank you for that, Hannah. We're looking forward to hearing um, your input here today as well. Um, I was going to move on to Rebecca next. Hi, Rebecca. Do you want to just introduce yourself as well? Hi, yes. Yeah, I'm Rebecca. I'm the Graduate Recruitment Manager at Herbert Smith Freehills. Um, for those of you that haven't heard of us, we're a city law firm um, and my job title is fairly self-explanatory. I recruit students onto our work experience programmes and eventually onto our training contract, which is the more traditional route to become a qualified solicitor. Um, so within my job, within my team, we cover everything from initial attraction, doing all those milk round events, assessments, uh, managing our cohorts. And yeah, I'm looking forward to diving into everything we've got to talk about today. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Rebecca. And then last but not least, we've got Kath um, from Atos. Kath, um, would you like to introduce yourself as well, please? Yeah, thanks, Nicola. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kath Hope, and I work at uh, Eviden and Atos Company, but I cover off emerging talent for both companies. So that's graduates, interns and apprentices. And my role is slightly different um, than Hannah's and Rebecca's because I do um, support the milk round recruitment um, events um, with our, our current graduates who go back to their universities to try and attract people. But I also um, have, a, a, have an overview of our graduate interns and apprentices when they come into our business for probably the first 18 months. So really the, the recruitment, um, I kind of get involved in it at the beginning, but also I see um, I see the importance of it in the second bit of my role, which is once the students are actually um, in our organisation. So really interesting topic for me and um, something that I'm really passionate about. And I'm really pleased to be here today. Fabulous. Thank you. So you, you don't just bring them on. You kind of follow them on that journey as well, which which must be really interesting. Um, well, really excited to hear um, all of your experiences and opinions today. Um, however, and, and you know, as everybody who's signed up to this will know, we're going to be exploring that topic of 
early career candidate experience. We're going to be thinking about how organisations can elevate their recruitment strategy so that they can firstly attract, but as Kath was just sort of hinting at, also retain that top emerging talent. So we'll be picking all three of your brains over the course, the course of the, the next hour. However, as with all good webinars, let's start with a quick poll. Um, I think I have um, my glamorous assistant is going to change the screen for me. And we're going to ask everybody to respond to a question. If I'm correct, the question is, I'm going to move to there. How would you rate your organization's current candidate experience for early career recruitment? Just give that a second and hopefully the poll will appear. Um, the poll is actually on, so um, it should it should appear on your screens. And if you just um, click on the questions, just one question, and we'll have our results immediately. We can't. I don't think I can't see that poll at the moment. Maybe we need to come back to it. Can any of my panelists see it? No, I can just see the agenda at the moment. Okay, we, we can come back to that, Paul. Maybe um, give me a nudge when we've got that working and we'll, we'll return We'll return to that a little bit later if, if we can get that working. Um, Technology is brilliant when it's working. Um, so let's, let's move on then. Let's start with our, our first, um, first panellist. So I was hoping that we could start with Kath. Um, and we have a, a question for Kath here, which is, what strategies can organizations like Atos implement to create a seamless and engaging candidate journey that leaves that lasting positive impression? Do you want to share some of your, your thoughts, opinions and experiences here for us, please, Kath? Yeah, so I think um, particularly in um, the early career space, um, Honesty around timelines is really important because unlike more traditional um, hiring for experienced hires, there tends to be um, a cycle. So you'll get lots of applicants all at one time, perhaps do lots of assessment centers all at one time, get offers out for start dates at a certain time. So there's that whole um, influx of activity at, at certain times. So, and I think sometimes that um, honesty about, okay, well, you might not hear from us for three weeks while we're doing all the assessment centres or concluding them all is, is really important. But I think um, even more important than that is having really engaged recruiters who will um, speak to candidates and deal with candidates really in quite a personal way. Um, we all want to be treated like individuals. We don't want to seem like we're just one of many. You know, let's let's try and make it more personal. So making sure that your recruiters make those connections with individuals and keep people informed um, on the way through, I think is, is really important, particularly in this space where, like I say, there can be many, many candidates all applying at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that is really interesting, actually. Um, any of our other panellists agree or disagree with that? I, I completely agree, <laughs> for what it's worth. Um, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think um, I think it's, you know, the, the timeline is, is really important in the recruitment journey, but then um, also around, you know, you will have probably quite a big lead time to when, between when you offer to when you actually start. Um, so, you know, when, when the candidates will actually start, so it's, it's making sure that that kind of that period of time that is as well as the recruitment process and that's that's as seamless and that's as open as honest around how long it's going to take for us to get back to a candidate in terms of timelines for assessments. It's also really important that when you offer that it's almost, you know, this is what's going to happen between when you're offered and when you start. So it's, it's that full kind of um, year journey, I guess, um, to be yeah. really conscious of that real sort of transparency with candidates. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you, do you lose many candidates in that that part of the 
journey do you find that there is a lot of dropout you know it's I think there can be dropouts can't there I think um many graduates um don't just apply for one particular company you know they're applying for lots of different organizations and so they might initially think that they're accepting the offer that they want but then you know a later assessment center might happen and actually they decide that that organization fits them better or or that that's you know, something that more directly links to their um, career aspirations. So I think, you know, um, an element of reneges probably is, is to be expected. But I think keeping in touch and being honest about timelines and stuff can, can help with kind of reducing that. Mm. And how manageable is that on a, on a practical level? Uh, so I think there's some strategies that you can do, you know, you can keep um, backup candidates you know keep backup candidates warm so that if you potentially have some dropouts you've you've got some people ready to go in the background to to take over um so so that's kind of one strategy but I do think at you know communication is the most important thing so that if someone is going to to renege on the offer you hear about it early and can put something in place mm. I guess also there's the piece there around uh, giving that positive impression of your organization right from the start so that when the other organization com- comes along that grad isn't tempted to move because they've already bought into into you um, I mean what sort of strategies have you applied um, to achieve that I guess open question to all three so I think you know letting them get in touch with um graduates who are already here you know um so that they can they can have those conversations from someone who's on the ground you know very often people can be a little bit skeptical around what's being told to them by a recruiter um so there's nothing like having them um in touch with people who are really who've been there you know been where they are and, and are able to kind of give them the the warts and all experience that um in the hope that obviously they're still with your organization and that means that that they've enjoyed the experience yeah yeah um so thinking also about um how you assess candidates um question is how how can the use of that sort of blended assessment approach um help you to effectively evaluate those early career candidates skills their competencies and their potential um at Atos, how, how have you used that to, to work in for yourselves? So I think that blended approach um, is really important because you're going to see many, many graduates um, who haven't got much work experience, so can't, you know, talk about that um, too much. And particularly those graduates who are coming out of the COVID times where lots of places, you know, they weren't able to get that that experience that potentially graduates from previous cohorts have been able to get. So by using a blended approach, you can really see lots of different aspects of of the um, potential uh, potential candidates because you're you're assessing um, you know skills potential aptitude and real um, attitude as well towards your organisation. So I think it's it's really important and and I think potentially for for the cohorts that have been through that time of COVID where things were very different for them, I think it's even more important that you're you're looking at that full rounded approach rather than just for example, doing an interview and expecting them to have experience and answers ready to go um, for those competency-based um, interviews. Yeah. So it's sort of really looking for that potential. Yeah, absolutely. It has to be, you know, it has to be about, you know, their willingness to learn and develop and, and their their attitude towards coming into to your organisation. You know, that's, that's really what you're looking for at this level. So do you feel that you're actually seeing um, a difference in what you're looking for now compared to pre-COVID? You know, you, you talked there about sort of potential for learning, interest in learning. Is that quite different to perhaps what you were looking for before COVID? Yeah, I think we're just more aware of the opportunities that people might not have had during the COVID times and that therefore... Um, there are extra opportunities that you can provide as an employer, you know, when people come in to, to really help boost confidence and, and skills that they might might have missed out on. And I think that's really, really important to, to kind of, it, it goes on to that piece about retention, isn't it? You know, having, being able to assess people's potential, but then allowing them to reach that potential when they're with you is really important. Yes, 
yeah so do you actually I, I guess this is kind of linked to my next question might not be but um how have these how have data conscious practices my original question was around how have they enhanced fairness and diversity in early early career recruitment I guess I'm also asking where you've got that data from a recruitment process is that helping you with your onboarding as well and retention so I'll answer the the first question yeah first. sorry but no it's fine in terms of you know how how do we um how do we use those blended assessments um and the data from them so yeah. I think it goes it goes back to the type of hiring we're doing here so you're you're very often hiring quite a large number of people in a short space of time and therefore you've got lots of different hiring managers involved you know different departments in the business and so the the approach that we use by making sure that all of them are going through the same process, uh, they're having the same questions asked, the same activity, whatever it might be, I think really does make sure that there's fairness inbuilt to that process um, because you're you're moving away from that ability um, for one candidate to be asked one lot of questions by a manager who likes it and another lot to be asked another you know so you you're increasing the fairness and I think we see um, a great diversity in our in our graduates and in interns particularly you know from um, gender and also from ethnicity but it's always something that we're looking at to get better at I think I think every company will say that that is something that they always want to improve on and that they're always keeping a look on. And that's where having that data in built in there and, and being able to review it at the end of the season or at certain points in the year is really useful. And, and Rebecca, I've not I've not come to you. Uh, you've got away with it so far. You know, does that resonate with you um, at HSF as well? Yeah, I think one of the main things that we've we've seen is that, you know, being a law firm kind of academics have always been a real high priority for us um you know um and we, we've never kind of struggled on on that front but actually you know just talking about what Kath mentioned in the COVID times a lot of grades have been inflated um and they haven't been candidates haven't been assessed in the exact same way as before so actually a first class degree nowadays might actually you know might not have made the cut for a first class degree pre COVID, for example, um, same with A-levels, people are getting kind of just pass marks and that kind of thing. So we've really had to use that kind of blended assessment, as Kath mentioned, you know, to make sure that we're making the right decisions for our for the firm in terms of, you know, that that whole picture piece. Um, so we've actually, I think the recruitment teams have actually been through it quite a lot um, in the past couple of years in, in, in terms of reacting to that and making sure that the processes in place are still hiring the right people internally despite the data points being slightly different um so it makes our jobs interesting keeps us on our toes yeah yeah no i, I completely understand that hannah did you have anything you wanted to add to that conversation yeah i i, I think yeah i think the, i think data is is paramount um in this in this new world that we're all living in, I think. Um, so just being able to um, review at the end of, of campaigns for early careers to, to make sure that, you know, you, you have kind of where candidates have um, dropped out in the various stages of the process is really important just to kind of see how that, how that um, approach to assessment is working. But then also um, that sort of real life MI is really important as you're going through that recruitment process as well. So making sure you're keeping a check, which I think Kath alluded to as well, but making sure you're keeping a check at every sort of point um, of the process um, to ensure that, you know, you are kind of considering that diversity, considering your um, inclusive, um, yeah. that everything is being as inclusive as possible. So yeah, it, it is more important than ever before to have that data driven yeah. insight. Yeah, and, and then I guess it's also what you're then going to do with that data. It's fine having it on a, on a dashboard or in a spreadsheet, but it's then yeah. that isn't it? as in regards to what the steps that you're going to take to deal with any yeah. issues that you're seeing on dropout or whatever it, it might be. Um, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, so that was Kath's question, but thank you everybody else for your input to that as well. Um, I have been told um, that we might be able to try and um, do the poll now. Um, so my instruction is participants can join the polls at slido.com and then I've got a number um, for them to enter 
Um, the number is 3287604. Shall we see if we can get this working? I've got my eyes on the ground that are going to attempt this for me. Ah. Okay. Thank you. We've got the slide now. So if we can all, if we, if anybody that is online jumps to that um, web address. Numbers are going up. This is really fun to watch. <laughs> the, the, the story's changing. <laughs> okay, we seem to have settled there, I think. So it, it looks like the Overall, the picture is pretty good. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of people responding at the very good and the the average. Obviously, a very good is what we should all be aspiring to, which I suspect is why people are on this call, coming here to learn more and share knowledge and and insight. Um, so, yeah, thank you everybody for taking part in that. It looks like it's a it's a, a relatively rosy picture, but still work to do. Sounds a little bit like one of my school reports. And um, thank you. So, should we move back to the slides now, then, please? Um, the other thing I've been primed to mention is that we do have um, time for Q&A at the end of this session. There is a Q&A section at the bottom of um, the screen. So if you do have a burning question for any of our panellists, do drop that in there and then we will make time at the end to cover that off. Thank you. So I'm going to go back to this, um, my, my next question, which was actually for Hannah. Um, so, as a reminder, Hannah's from um, Nationwide Building Society. She um, introduced herself at the beginning. Question to you, Hannah, is um, what do you see are the benefits and the best practices of incorporating video interviewing in this early career recruitment process, you know, including remote assessments and virtual connections? Yeah. Um, so, I'll break it down into the probably the two areas, so the, the benefits um, and then some of the best practices afterwards that we found. So I'll be really honest with, with everybody that I've, I've kind of had varying successes with them um, with using video interview in, throughout, throughout my um, career. And actually, when we um, went into the pandemic and we decided to use a video interview three years ago as part of our assessment process, it was really important that we did it right, because I think that there was um, an element of, of nervousness about putting um, a video interview in, into our assessment process. So what we found and, and what the benefits of the video interview that we have so far is, has completely outweighed some of those potential concerns that we initially had. So benefits to video interviewing, I think are fairly sort of, um, some of them are fairly obvious. Um, they, they can be quite far reaching for your uh, candidates, but also for your in-house teams. Um, the main one, obviously, as we all know, is the flexibility and convenience. So being able to actually conduct an interview in the candidate's own time from the comfort of their own home, um, especially with students that are perhaps in lectures all the way um, you know, throughout their day or maybe have part time jobs, those sorts of things. So to be able to conduct an, and complete a video interview in an evening or an early morning is, is really convenient. And then on the flip side of that, for the internal teams, being able to have that opportunity to assess and actually score those interviews when it's convenient for you. Um, so on the back of that, then what we found by using video interviews is that we've been able to um, reduce that time to um, time to progress. So instead of having to make a phone call, book in an interview, all of those sorts of things, actually what we've been able to do is actually reduce that time frame for our candidates. 
So um, convenience and flexibility is, is, is the key one that we've actually found in, in terms of the benefits for the video interview. Um, it also kind of expands your candidate pool. So what we have found is that candidates, you know, tend to be a bit hesitant about speaking to somebody necessarily on the phone or actually even traveling for that first stage interview. So it does kind of expand that pool a little bit um, and it also makes people that perhaps were living in a different location, perhaps for university who didn't want to travel down to your offices. It gives them that kind of um, opportunity to be able to sell themselves without having to, to sort of travel and, and additional expenses. Um, so in terms of um, inclusivity as well, probably as, in, as well as expanding that geographical locational piece, but you, you've actually also then got the um, opportunity to be able to um, have people perhaps with disabilities that are less inclined to travel as well, can actually um, you know, conduct the interview from their home environment. Um, as I said at the start, though, we've been really conscious that we didn't want to make video interviewing a um, just like a, a standard step in the process. And, you know, we wanted to make sure it was as interactive as possible um, as, as a recording can be. So, um, you know, things like, um, you know, making sure that, you know, you've got maybe some students, current students actually asking the questions on a video platform kind of helps. Um, some of the other best practices that we've got is, is say having an introduction from say your CEO is quite impactful as well um, or somebody in, in kind of a senior role um, who perhaps have been through the graduate program so, so those sorts of things can really make it as something that is virtual can make it feel a lot more interactive and also give candidates an opportunity to kind of get to know the company a little bit better. Yeah. So th those are the kind of the benefits, I guess, and, and best practices that we found with, with the video interview um, so far. And, and um, Kath or Rebecca, um, you know, I'm not sure of your, your own experiences with video, video interviews, I can see Rebecca nodding. Um, you know, is there anything that you'd like to add to that in terms of some of the benefits that it's offered or some of the best practices that, that, that you've implemented? Um, so we also were forced to kind of go into video interviews, obviously, in the pandemic. And um, when we came out and we were able to do in-person interviews again, it was very much a should we stick with what we've been doing or should we revert back? Um, and actually, our data showed from um, uh, all the universities that have been surveyed and, and that kind of thing that people were very keen to get back into the office. So actually, we've made the decision to no longer use video interviews. Um, so, I mean, there's obviously so many benefits, as Hannah has mentioned, but I think there's also, you know, the, the flip side of the diversity point is that not all students have an environment to conduct an interview in. Um, you know, they might have a shared bedroom at home, they might not have Wi-Fi, you know, those types of, of considerations. Um, and I just think, you know, you can, you can semi-combat the diversity point by obviously reimbursing in full any travel expenses or, or that type of thing that have been incurred by coming to an in-person interview. Um, and, you know, our assessors are also um, more confident about their own decision making when they see people in person. But I think it depends on how many stages of interviews you have within your process. Um, you know, for an in initial sifting interview, of course, that can be done virtually. But at HSF, we just have one big assessment centre held in the office. Um, and so there's, there isn't a need for us to, to do that. But I do think if it's more kind of volume recruitment where, like I said, that sifting needs to be done, then absolutely a video interview is, is perfect for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, thank you, um, Rebecca. So, yeah, it sounds like you've you sort of made the switch back to the, the to face to face and doing it all in one one go. Um, and, and Kath, a, a video interview, something that you've been using or or not? Yeah, we use a video interview, yeah. um, like Rebecca says, more as kind of um, to, to do a bit of a sift um, before we get to the assessment centre stages. And I think some of the benefits that Hannah mentioned are uh, what I would have said uh, in, in my answer to in terms of the candidates being able to do it in their, their own time whenever suits is, is great, but also for, for the recruiters to be able to watch it back um, and, and, and do it in their time and therefore be able to take the right amount of time to score those interviews rather than feeling rushed, I think is uh, is of the benefits that we that we see 
th there is a question that's popped. I know the question, the Q&A sessions at the end, so I'm going um, off brief a little here and I might get told off. But there is a question that's just popped up, which um, an anonymous attendee has asked around. Is there any um, business appetite to look at the use of um, AI, artificial intelligence? in the video interview phase um i guess question to all three of you really is that something that you have considered or are considering or have ruled out even i think for us at the moment um it's very much we want um a person to re re review the video interview when we're not using ai I, AI at the moment. Having said that, as a technology organisation, I definitely wouldn't uh, wouldn't completely rule that out. But certainly at the moment, the discussion isn't there. It's very much, you know, um, at, at one of our recruiters looks yeah. at all of the all of the video interviews. So it is all based on, um, you know, that person reviewing the candidate. Mm. Yeah, and, and um, I guess Hannah and Rebecca, um, it, it, what's the the Live the land yeah. where I think the same really I think AI seems to it seems to pop up like every two three years I feel like there's some some new kind of AI and it's the new kind of thing that sort of comes out and we at the moment in Nationwide we um similar to what Kath said I, th I think we've you know we've used the blended assessment approach so we've got candidates doing that online um, assessments for us and the first then interactive sort of, well, a semi-interactive thing is actually the video interview before they then come into the, the full-blown virtual assessment centre with us. So actually to then move to an AI perspective doesn't quite feel right um, at this within the process that we've currently got. Mm. So our appetite to move to that AI space is, is not quite there at the moment. But, you know, as Kath said, that, that it, that's not to say that it won't move into that direction in the future. But I think we've got to be careful to find the balance between um, using online assessments and virtual assessments and being able to use the ease and the process of that versus, versus actually having that sort of human contact as well. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we've been doing um, some research on AI. We've got clients that use um, automated scoring and the the data is is fascinating. You know, when you look at um, different group differences and um, the potential for, for bias with humans versus computers but that's yeah. a whole other conversation um yeah. i suspect and um, i'm sure we'll be talking about for some time to come yet um yeah so thank you for that um my next question um is around best practices in data-driven recruitment um, and diversity um and i was going to pick on rebecca this time um or give rebecca a chance to speak um so the question to you is how can organizations approach data conscious early recruitment practices to ensure fairness, diversity and informed dis decision making. And I guess specifically, how have you done this at, at HSF, if you would be so kind as to share your thoughts? Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, we're very into data over here at, at HSF. Um, so, you know, the more information in general that you have on an individual, on a situation, situation um whatever it might be the more the more informed your decision making will be and i know um a couple of you made the point earlier about kind of um being able to analyze that data correctly and use the data correctly so there's that there's that caveat around you know having the data but what do we do with it um and yeah at, at hsf we get around four thousand applications a year um for 120 ish work experience places and then from that 120 ish, we need to identify 65 people that then go on to be to get a training contract. So we actually have, you know, a fairly severe tunnel <laughs> funnel, sorry, to to get to, and we need to make sure that we've whittled it down correctly. So any data that we can get, the better. So I know someone flagged earlier about kind of having reports, whether it's end of campaign reports. Luckily at HSF, we have an amazing data team that helps pull weekly reports for us, um, and. Uh, the, the reason behind that is because we run assessment centers four days a week for about three months. Um, yeah. So we need to identify if anything's going wrong or we're picking um, or, you know, there's a bias shown towards any particular groups. We're addressing it very quickly. Um, and that's really, really helpful for us. Um, you know, at the end of the campaign, you know, I'm sure we all do this, but kind of looking at what has worked well. Um, have, have we had any issues with any particular groups, any gaps? um in in our particular you know in the, in our numbers and i don't know have we faced an issue attracting a particular group have any applications dropped off from universities compared to the year before um 
you know, all of that information is really helpful to kind of set strategy. We also look at rankings of universities, in our case for a law firm, so we're interested in the ranking of the law school too. Um, what we've really found on the diversity and inclusion front that's been particularly helpful is HESA data. Um, so looking at how those particular universities and the people that are studying different courses at those universities, what they look like. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's actually really helpful. We might then adapt our strategy at that university to sponsor a particular society there um, or, um, you know, send people from, from the firm who have gone to those particular universities who can speak to those points in a bit more of a convincing way, I think, um, and really look to ramp up our efforts. Um, so that's really important for us um, if we're struggling in a particular area. Um, so I think they're more, I guess, the quantitative data points, but we also, um, we engage with different, different third party providers um, to help us determine how we're, um, how we're viewed, how, what the opinions are on HSF with our particular target groups. Um, so that's done through kind of surveys and that kind of thing. So having that more qualitative data from, from individuals is really helpful too for student attitudes, opinions. We've also got campus ambassadors on the ground helping us with that as well um, to really help us have a, a full picture. So we're not just kind of doing the same thing every year to, um, and hoping that it still works. Um, and also we're work, trying to identify if things have worked well, why? Um, and can we replicate that elsewhere across across the country in terms of our university strategies? Um, yeah. So yeah, like I said, the more info, the better, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's obviously, um, that talks very much to that recruitment, that attraction piece. And it sounds like you're putting a lot of effort into ensuring that you know, you're know you using that data to inform the plan and the strategy for, for, for years to come. How do you um, leverage data and analytics to drive recruitment and assessment decisions within this context of the early career hiring? Yeah, so one of the main things that we rely on um, and, and benefit from is we use a contextual data tool, um, which obviously, as it might suggest, um, provides context for an individual's achievements or, or lack of achievements. Um, so, um, you know, whether they don't have much or any, I don't know, work experience or, um, you know, because I don't know, they've been a carer or they've been, you know, they're a refugee um, or their grades are slightly lower than, you know, we, we expect because there's the school that they went to is in the bottom percentile. Um, you know, if we know that, if we have that context, um, you know, we can determine um, that they probably demonstrate quite a few of the key skills and attributes that we're looking for in our future talent. Um, you know, that we're not necessarily overlooking people we might have done if we didn't know that information. Um, we're also, um, at HSF, we're, we look at kind of analysing um, data from our trainee solicitor population um, and then how they've kind of gone on to perform when, once they've qualified as a solicitor and what success has looked like for them. So any high performing, you know, junior solicitors in our case, um, you know, are there, are there any um, trends within that particular population that we can then look at, including in our screening guidelines? Um, you know, what has worked well previously? Should we include that going forward? Is that something that we need to have prioritized and identify in our talent coming through? Um, that's really important for us. And we review our screening guidelines every, every year to make sure that, that that's included. Um, we look at utilization figures as well um, at law firms. You know, they, I think they record their time every six minutes, yeah. something crazy. Um, and so looking at the utilization um, figures as well, you know, are we right, hiring the right number of, of grads each year? Um, is it too much work, not enough work for, for that particular pool? Um, and you know how many people we then need to re recruit. Um, in, data in really does that. it really does drive so many of your decisions at so many touch points. Yeah, right it, from it really does. Yeah. interaction with a candidate who you know doesn't doesn't maybe not have even heard of HSF when they're wandering around the university campus, for example, and it's really drawing on that data. Um, was there anything that you would to like to add to that, um, Kath or, or Hannah, um, just adding to you know, Rebecca's really well explained point around how they use data, anything you'd like to add to that? Uh, 
Um, I think. Um, to add to that really, I think. We no, were... I don't. Really... <laughs> to be honest, I think Rebecca said like pretty much. That's. Um, I've made a few notes actually yeah. um, from some of the things. So I think that there's. Um, there's so. I think the point is, is that there is so much that you can do with data, isn't there? So I think you know, it's it's. But it's apps, as I said earlier, it's absolutely paramount to a successful recruitment campaign, but also then using that data to, to see how people are progressing going forwards. I mean, we're on a bit of a journey in nationwide at the moment to make sure that we're looking at sort of the scoring at the assessment centres and, and where people have um, shown sort of development and needs as part of the um, recruitment process, and then looking to sort of trail that throughout their first couple of of years within the, the graduate or the um, apprenticeship program so I think um, it's really important for that recruitment process perspective and looking at your IND but then also for as Rebecca's quite clearly said is, is actually also then looking at what what success looks like so they can be successful at that end of the assessment center but actually you know are they going to be successful at the end of the program and actually give you know the give the business the skills and the, the capabilities that we're actually looking for right from the outset so I think it is you're right Nicholas it, it is Pretty, pretty much it's a broad, a broad span of data that, that is so important. Absolutely. And it's been able to join all of that data together because if the left yeah. is to the right hand, you're missing a trick there, aren't you? As a psychologist, you know, one of the, the, the battles that we often have is, you know, you've got all this amazing recruitment data, you've got some training data. How do we link those together? You know, it's yeah. like getting that bigger picture. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's a lot of investment, you know, in your recruitment process, if you're not actually looking at whether it's having the impact that you want it to have. So yeah, yeah. fascinating stuff. Um, I am aware I've got to keep on time there. So I'm going to move on to the next question, which is an open question for, for all of you. Um, so kind of focusing on nurturing talent for future success here. So how can organisations like yours um, support the development and the growth of your early career hires? which offers that solid foundation for their longer term professional journey. Open question, um, dive in whoever would like to go first. Go first if you like. So, so yeah, um, the graduates, interns and apprentices, all, um, all of those at Atos go through um, a programme called Advance Your Future. And that's um, depending on which scheme you're on, um, either a two week or, or a one week um, course where we really um, delve into um, what's called strengths deployment inventory. So we really get our, uh, our emerging talent to really start learning about themselves um, and uh, how they react, how they communicate, how they behave. And then, uh, so that's always uh, a really interesting and I get a lot of feedback um, around that because it, it just helps them learn a bit more about themselves and think a bit more about how how they're working in that business environment um, and then we follow that up with various different sessions throughout the period of time on business and personal skills that we feel are the basis for starting your career which is essentially what these uh, these people are doing so so you know um Things like how do they um, how do they present to stakeholders if they've never had to do that really um, you know at uh, university or at school or college um, how do they deal with influencing more more people more senior or or in the hierarchy in the business these types of things that are all skills that perhaps you know need to be learned and uh, and obviously when you've been in an organization for 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 a while you would hope that you've built those skills but you've got to put yourself back into that position where you're just starting out when really you know that wasn't a skill that potentially you had so all of our um, emerging talent as we call it go on go on that course and really get to delve deeper into themselves but also delve deeper into some um business and personal skills that no matter what your job is, they're going to be useful. So we hire some really technical graduates, but we also hire some more business focused graduates. But what we find is actually those business and personal skills are relevant no matter which, um, which type of graduate they are. And I think that's kind of the starting foundational point um, for kickstarting their career, you know, um, moving forward. But then making sure that... Um, the line managers are looking at them as individuals because of course that training as I mentioned is for everybody but then there has to be an individual element as well in terms of 
different people do different jobs will will have different needs so i think looking at that individual development plan whatever whatever every organization calls it you know it might be different names but looking at that that program of learning that they can do um, you know we have a vast amount of training in our organization that's available and it's um it's kind of a two-way thing i think um for for um our emerging talent and this is something we talk about on advance your future too it's not just about the manager identifying what um you know what development areas the candidate has but it's also about um it's also about them really wanting to drive themselves forward and thinking um, for themselves around, okay, well, I need to learn more about this or I want to learn more about that and really making the most of all the opportunities that we have. And I think that that's a win-win in terms of the individual is getting more skills, but as a business, you're getting people who are more rounded and whose skills are much more varied. So I think that's, that's really important, um, particularly you know, in this field that we work in. It goes back to that point you made earlier about looking for those people that want to learn and, and, and you know, are curious as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Hannah, I can see you nodding along with a lot of that. Is there anything anything that you want to add to that point? Yeah, so, so, um, so similar to Kath, like we've um, we did a bit of research recently on kind of what what specific things would um, our new cohorts and also our hiring managers over the last few years. Are there any sort of specific things that we're not doing? Um, or that we could do better in terms of the development. And one thing that's come out is around this business readiness. Um, so the basics, things like uh, how do you use Teams? What's the best way to use an email? What's, you know, these um, these graduates and, and um, you know, not just graduates, but any kind of early careers people may be in a position that they've, you know, they've never been in that kind of office environment before. So similar to what Kath's saying around that, sort of the, the wider piece around these softer skills and influencing and developing yourself and having the confidence to be able to do that is also just the basics, I think is really important to remember is, you know, how you do all of those things, how you log on in the morning, you know, what is what is the kind of um, the process of how to request holiday, even those kind of basic things can make this early career population feel comfortable going into that kind of their first office role. Yeah, and yeah. I think that's important. So that is so is, is huge. <laughs> I have a 17 year old who drives no 18 now she, who drives me nuts because she um, you, opens her emails and then doesn't file them. They're just sort of, yeah. you know, once you get into the world of work, that's got to change. Yeah. <laughs> those Find her loads of folders then, though, really. Yeah. That's the thing, yeah. All you need. <laughs> and, and, and Rebecca, um, from, you know, the HSF perspective, w- w- anything you'd like to add? Obviously, it's quite niche. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it is a little bit niche, but not to go down that rabbit hole, I, I would just probably add to all of this is that our, our aim is to recruit a more diverse, cohort and you cannot assume that everyone is starting from the same level and this all of this is so much more important um to train to develop to make sure everyone has the same access to everything once that you know prior to them joining and once they're here because you know someone from a lower socioeconomic background might just simply have no idea how to interact with with more senior stakeholders compared to if someone's come from a more privileged background had more work experience because of you know their family connections for example and they they, they just get it um and yeah just kind of emphasizing how much more important this is for for all companies to do um considering how diverse our populations are are, are getting yeah yeah no that that it's it's um it's brilliant it's it's fascinating and it sounds like there's a lot of commonalities there across the approaches Kathy you having an issue with your your light on the timer it is indeed as I'm waving my arm about like an idiot so I'm sorry about that but yeah (laughs) I just still for too long we're energy saving you know it goes off (laughs) it just means that when you're doing a presentation you've got to do a bit of a jig halfway through (laughs) I, th- I thought that was the case um yeah well thank you everybody and um, we do have lots of questions um that have been put on the um the q a section i will try and um prioritize them in a way that kind of makes things fit with the conversation that we've been having some are quite transactional some require a bit more of a sort of um bigger picture thinking um one question is, and I guess this has kind of come out as part of the answers that you've been providing. Can I just ask what assessments you use as part of your recruitment process? So um, do you want to just quickly go around the room, Rebecca? I think we've kind of got 
we, we, we've got this, but can you just confirm for the audience what assessments you're using? Yeah, so application form and then the SOVA online um, test, which is um, something that was designed bespoke to HSF. Um, and then a recruiter will, if you pass that test, we then review your form. It's a human being, it's not AI. And then you are invited to an assessment centre in the office. Um, there's three different elements of the assessment centre. Um, and then you come on to the vacation scheme, which is the work experience programme. Thank you. Um, Kath, do you want to just confirm what you're using as well, just for the audience? People apply online and then um, we do the uh, personality and co cognitive assessments with SOVA, um, a video interview, and then the, the final piece of our puzzle is a virtual assessment centre. Um, and that's at that point you would then get offered, um, offered the role or, or not. Okay, thank you. And, and sorry, last but not least, Hannah. Yeah, so we do, um, same, we do a, a blended assessment approach, online assessment. So candidates apply, um, they will complete, um, and this is bespoke to nationwide, a personality questionnaire, cognitive reasoning, and also a situational judgment questionnaire. Um, and then they, should they then pass that element, it's automated to then go through to the video interview, and then obviously could go through to the virtual assessment centre. The virtual assessment centre, we do a group exercise, a um, written role play and an interview. Thank so you. really using everything that we possibly can. <laughs> but that's how you get that complete picture, that whole person assessment. Yeah. You know, you're seeing them from all the different angles, all different lenses. Um, another question that came up was, and one of our attendees keen to understand the percentage completion rates for video interviews. They're seeing graduate candidates are more likely to complete these with apprentice candidates, not, not as high. Um, for those of you that are using the video interview, you just, if you've got any sort of data that you could share on that off the top of your head? Yeah, uh, I've not got actual figures, but the experience is similar actually. Um, we do see apprentices less likely um, or, or less willing um, initially to do that. So I think that's where having your engaged recruiters that will um, will speak to people on a personal level can, can really help, you know, um, to increase that, you know, if people aren't completing it, contact them and, and find out, you know, why do they need an adjustment? Because actually what we've had to do before for certain candidates is rather than do the video interview, actually have to do it as a telephone interview just to make it a reasonable adjustment for someone. So I think having those... Having those really, um, I suppose, engaged recruiters who are going to connect at a personal level with the individuals just to see um, what's going on where possible. I appreciate in big numbers, sometimes it's not possible. We have less apprentices than graduates. So in our case, we're able to do that to try and bump up that number. Yeah. OK. And um, Hannah, which was yeah, very similar. Yeah, very similar. So um, we do get um, a good um, conversion or, or people actually going on to complete their video interview in the graduate space. Definitely a drop off in apprentices. Um, the way that we've counted that is similar to Kath is the engagement. So what we found is that um, actually even having sort of um, uh, like guidance sessions, so setting up kind of webinars um, when you're in um, recruiting or they you know, do you want to come and join um, a conversation with us to, you know, to talk around any concerns you may have around um, any parts of the process, give you a bit of hints and tips, guidance, um, and also just making sure that it's um, the one good thing about the, the process that we have in, in Nationwide is it's very linear. So what we had before was very much a stop start approach. So it was always that candidates would do the online test, then they'd have to wait for a response and then they get sent an email with another link and then they come back and then it gets sent out. So we've, we have found actually through that kind of very linear approach that actually are, we, we have seen an, a definite increase in the completion of video interviews um, across the board because candidates don't have to wait and have that sort of um, stop start approach. But for apprentices, definitely there's a, a decrease in the number of um, people that are completing that video interview stage, regardless of that linear approach. So yeah, it's similar to Kath, engagement, um, guidance is probably for that apprenticeship is, is really important before and feeling that that you know they're supported um, throughout that process is is yeah really really important. Thank you, thank you. That's um, a great answer. Um, 
no, we have got quite a few few questions. Might, for anybody that is here that has asked a question, we might not, we probably won't get through them all, um, but we can get a report polled and we'll be able to follow up, um, you know, as needed in individually. Um, one question we have got time for: um, How much guidance and training is needed for hiring managers around the benefits of assessment in a graduate space? Is this something that any of you have come across? Rebecca's definitely nodding. There is that something that you're dealing with. Yeah, so before we kick off our, our recruitment season, we do a, a, a roundup presentation to all everyone who's involved in the graduate recruitment space, um, recruiters, assessors, um, supervisors, etc., reminding them of our process, what the candidates go through, and then what what are we looking for, and if that has changed, you know, since since they were last involved. Um, and I think you need to do that just from an engagement perspective, um, because we rely, you know, I said we do three months of assessment centres, we rely a lot on, on, you know, our internal teams to support us to deliver those, and we need them to be engaged, um, and we need them to know, um, to, to be guided in terms of how to to interview these candidates and what we're looking for. I know I mentioned the contextual data tool earlier, but if they don't know how to interpret that data or to use that data to help them with their decisions, then the tool is kind of redundant. So we, we make sure everyone is aware of, of our aims and you know what we're looking for and, and the process every year. It's really important. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, there was a question for both Hannah and Kath. Yeah, I've lost. Um, Kath and Hannah, you both mentioned learning sessions for business readiness. Are these trainings delivered internally or do you have them delivered by external providers? What's working well for you for yourselves? Hannah, do you want to respond to yeah, that? Yeah, so in, internally. Um, so it's it's by a learning development um, team um, and they are the ones that have kind of engaged with the business alongside us to kind of find out what the candidates are looking for. And then also from the hiring manager perspective. So Generally, it's um, yeah, it is in internal that we are doing it. Kath, what about um, yourself? With the opposite, actually, we use an external um, company and kind of harness their uh, expertise and also their knowledge of what else is going on in the market. So clearly, we input what we think um, that that we want to include in our program, but then we we use the industry knowledge that our training company. Um, can provide us as well to just um, alter our approach if we need to or confirm that actually we're doing doing yeah. the right things. So I guess the summary, the, the way to answer that question is it sounds like there is no one size fits all and you've got to, you know, do your research and find out what's going to work best for you based on who mm. you've got in house, the expertise you've got and the audience that, that you're working with. And uh, thank you. Um, right, we're very close to the end now. So firstly, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to everybody that's attended. I know um, Georgia will probably drop on again in a minute and say thank you as well. But I wanted to um, personally thank you for um, the time that you've put into this. I guess for me, some of the key takeaways from this session, number one, it's been fascinating. Um, number two, some of the key themes. I think there's something here around this sort of nurturing, this um, communication, this honesty, sort of uh, all sitting under the umbrella of building a psychological contract with your applicants, your candidates, and then your trainees and graduates once they, they join you. So while we're all working in this, this sort of virtual online world, that personal touch in whatever way works for you, it still remains to be really important because you are you're sort of fighting for the talent still and you're wanting to retain them. Um, I think also data has come out as absolutely key across all of your your businesses here and it's not just having that data it's using that data in a meaningful way and using it to inform policies decisions you know and even what you're going to do tomorrow um if needed um so i think they were the sort of some of the key takeaways um for me and yeah once again thank you for your your input to that and i'll hand back uh, no sorry i've also got to say if you do want to follow up on anything with sova um we will share details of how to get um, in touch with us if you've got any questions for us around how we can help with your um, recruitment and your assessment do let us know and I really am handing back to Georgia now. 
<laughs> thank you, Nicola, and thank you to the panel as well. Really fascinating hour of conversation. And thank you, Nicola, for facilitating all of that. And thank you to the panel for sharing all that, that wisdom and experience with our audience. And thank you, audience, for all the great questions. As Nicola said, we couldn't get to everyone today, but we will follow up um, and we will also be providing details uh, when we release the recording um, of today's session. So you can look back on this, you can share it with colleagues, and you'll also be able to get in touch with Sova if you have any follow-ups that you'd like to make after today's call. So thank you so much everyone for, for joining us today. I'm going to wish you a lovely and I hope sunny afternoon wherever you are um, in the office or, or working elsewhere and thank you so much again to everyone for today's session. Really really interesting. Have a great day everyone and we look forward to hearing from you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.